Welcome to another episode of the Sun Foundation's virtual clean water celebration, Clean Water Champions. Would you like to sail around the world? Literally cross from California to Hawaii? Search the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and visit the Great Lakes while you're at it. Where would you like to go? As you are traveling, imagine being on a boat made out of trash. To study trash. To follow it back to its source. Marcus Erickson founded the organization... Marcus Erickson founded the organization Five Gyres to Make a Difference. Let's hear his story. Follow him on his journey. I to take you on a journey of adventure and science about plastic pollution in the world's oceans. I've had the, the, the privilege to sail around the world and see the most remote parts of our planet and see where our trash goes. So I'm going to talk about plastics. That's been my focus the last 10 years, but it goes back further than that, how this issue of plastic in the world's, in the environment started. You go back to 1955. Here's a, uh, an article from Life Magazine, 1955, titled Throwaway Living. And I brought the article here. I got the actual magazine. And in this magazine, the article reads, let me find it real quick. It says, the objects... The objects flying through the air in this picture would take 40 hours to clean, except that no housewife need bother. They're all meant to be thrown away. What does that mean, throw it away? Where is away? Well, I've had a chance to go around the world and see where away is. But, you know, back then, we weren't thinking about that. We didn't think plastic could pollute the entire planet. Now, I love these magazines because the ads are really ridiculous and funny. So plastics in 1955 kind of began, and they were trying to sell it. Some ad executive said, hey, we'll put a baby in the bag, and we'll sell millions of bags. It's a little creepy. If that doesn't creep you out, how about the double? That's not bad enough. Try the triple. And this was the beginning of throwaway living. But here's how it looks today. If you go around the world, you can find communities that don't have really good waste management. They haven't got garbage cans. And what they've known for centuries is that the things that we use and consume are made of organic materials, things like banana leaves and apple cores and wood and paper, things that are part of a natural biological cycle. Plastic doesn't fit that cycle. It, it persists. And you find it polluting, for example, this is a river chocked full of plastics. But you know, I think also about this young man's life. If you look at his face, you can maybe see a reflection of your own. He's your age. And his life is spent pulling trash out of this polluted river. And I think of the potential lost and what he could be. He could be a doctor, a lawyer, a politician. And that is lost in this in this life of trash. And I think of where we should be as young people, in the natural environment, learning about the beauty of nature. I myself, I grew up in Louisiana. I grew up next to the Mississippi River. I used to jump in the river and swim until I could feel the current tugging at my toes, come back to the bank, catching snakes and turtles. Well, when I ended high school, I found myself in the first Gulf War. I was one of those Marines. If you saw images of the first Gulf War, you might see pictures of burning oil wells in Kuwait City back in 1991. I was one of those Marines among those oil wells. I remember sitting in a foxhole in the sand, covered in bits of oil and soot, and thinking, what are we doing? How do we get here? What are we fighting for? But then I'm talking to a Marine next to me in the foxhole, and we're almost laughing because we're both from New Orleans and we're saying, if we survive this war, let's build a raft like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. And we had this amazing plan to take oil drums and, and logs and make our homemade raft. Well, I couldn't find him later, but 13 years later, I built my own raft. I took 232 two-liter plastic bottles and I made a pontoon boat. I took two bicycles, welded them together, made a paddle wheel, like your paddle wheel you have here in the Illinois River. And I, and I had a friend drop me off in Lake Itasca, Minnesota, way north, the headwaters of the Mississippi. And I spent a whopping five months just drifting 
down the river, letting the current take me through America's greatest watershed. And I can tell you, for me personally, it was a cathartic experience. I reconnected with the goodness of people and the beauty of the river. I fell in love with the Mississippi River. When I go back home now to New Orleans, I will often cross the levee and touch the river as if I'm shaking hands with a friend. And, I, and the people who I met, people that gave me clothing and food, gave me shelter, helped to fix my raft along the way. I realized the beauty of life around me, people and places, other living things. And then when I saw trash, when I saw the abundance of plastics coming down this river, I could always look left or right. I could pick up a bottle here, a bottle cap, a straw, a styrofoam cup, a plastic bag going by. It hit me personally, because for me, the river is family. And see, all this trash going out to sea, I had a choice to make. What was I going to do? What are you going to do when you're confronted with challenges in your life? How often do you hear people say, oh, that's all messed up. Somebody should do something, and they walk away. Or do you think, that's wrong. I'm going to step up and do what I can to make a change, a positive change. Do what, what I can in my world to fix this. When I got off my trip on the Mississippi, I wanted to see where trash goes. How far into the oceans, in the deep blue, does this garbage flow? So, my wife and I, we took 15,000 plastic bottles in Los Angeles, where I live today. And we took old fishing nets, we sewed them together, made giant socks, 30 feet long, about this big around, and stuffed them full of bottles, made six long pontoons. They went to every junkyard in Southern California and cut the masts off these broken sailboats and junkyards and laid them, ten this way, ten that way, and tied them together and made our deck. And for a cabin, I chose something that was designed for wind and waves and waterproof. I took a, a Cessna 310 aircraft, grinded off all the unnecessary nuts and bolts, and tied it all together. But 10,000 knots later, I had a boat, and we called it junk. It's a big, giant pile of junk. And we were towed about 60 miles offshore into the Pacific Ocean, and I knew those ocean currents, the same currents that take trash or take debris offshore, would take my big pile of junk offshore toward Hawaii if I'm lucky. I figured three to four months we'd get there. If I missed Hawaii, three to four months to Japan. If I missed Japan, three to four years to come back to California. I had to make it to Hawaii. So I want to show you right now four little videos that we shot. They're about ocean plastics and about this voyage on the junk raft. The first video is kind of funny. It's about our, our worst storm day three. I remember day three, there's 50 knot winds rushing through, giant waves, eight to 10 foot waves crashing on top of the raft. One wave hit the airplane so hard, it pushed it one foot across the deck while I was trying to sleep inside. I step out in the morning out of the airplane into water. We sunk 18 inches overnight. What I discovered is that the ocean was loosening the caps on all the bottles. And they were flattening out, so I'm filling full of water. I got my satellite phone out of the dry bag and I called my wife and I said, hey babe, we're sinking. And I could hear her mother, because she, she was at a coffee shop having coffee that morning. I could hear her, her mom saying, go get your man, he's out there. And she did. In about three days, about, about two days, she shows up. She charted a dive boat, and they came, and I said, all I want is a bunch of glue. I need glue to glue the caps back on the bottles. We can't give up the mission. It's too important. The world needs to know about trash in the oceans. And she showed up. We spent about six, eight hours together gluing caps on as many bottles as possible. She left the glue with me, and every day for the rest of the journey, I'd pull 10 bottles out, pour the water out, blow them up, glue the cap back on to keep sailing. But this first video is not about the, the storm, it's about the fact that all my food got wet when we were sinking. All my bread and grain was gone, it was, all the rice was, was all, all salty, and all the labels washed off my cans. I had like 300 cans of, of beans, corn, and peas. So we spent the next few months playing mystery meal.
the ocean stripped all the labels off our cans. It got rusted. Now we got to eat them. It's all beans and corn. And peas. Okay, so we'll Come on, corn. Give me 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 corn. Corn. Beans. <laughs> One more? Yeah. Hey, let's see what it is. We have the best. Let's go for the best before. Four beans. No wind. We're completely becalmed today. It's no wind whatsoever. So we're just going to fish and eat. Fishy, 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 fishy. Oh, there he is. Right now. <laughs> Lunch. We are now skirting the edge of the North Pacific Gyre, roughly 1,000 miles east of Hawaii. We're finding lots of plastic on the surface of the ocean. It's mostly small fragments, blue, green, white, and black, among many different kinds of zooplankton. Everywhere you go in the North Pacific Ocean, we find plastic. So I filleted this fish, thinking we're going to eat it, and here's what I found. It's full of plastic. This is the whole reason that we're out here, to bring this to your attention. The plastic isn't benign. The fish won't pass it. The plastic is full of persistent organic pollutants, things like PCBs, DDT, PAHs, things that are known human carcinogens and endocrine disruptors, things you don't want in your body, but they're in the fish that we eat. I don't want plastic for my sushi. Took a lot more than three or four weeks at sea. Took a whopping 13 weeks. We ran out of food. And I remember seeing the small fish. We're almost in the middle of the ocean, halfway between Los Angeles and Hawaii. And I see this fish, I throw out a hook, I fillet the fish, and I take my, my little fillet knife and I just touch the stomach that was clearly expanded and these 17 particles of plastic popped out. And I remember, again, I had that, that moment where I had to ask myself, do I step up or step back? I could step back and say, wow, that's messed up. But instead, I thought, what's missing? What's missing our understanding of, of, of the life cycle of plastic? in our understanding of what a way really means. What's missing? And I thought in the science, this is where the science kicked in. As a scientist, I thought, okay, we don't know how much plastic is out there. This is going back 10 years. We don't know where it is. And we don't fully understand the ecological impacts. This species was unknown to eat trash until this photograph, until I took it. So we launched our expeditions, more expeditions, on real sailboats to survey the planet. And that, this, be, this is the first of over 20 expeditions to survey microplastics on the sea surface. But our first expedition... Let's bring it in. Lots of larval fish, sargassum, and little plastic particles. Yeah. Look at that. We're in the middle of the North Atlantic Gyre also called the Sargasso Sea. It's called the Sargasso Sea because of sargassum. It's a kind of seaweed that filled our nets. But it's also full of small particles of plastic. God, there we go. What you got, Anna? I see one it's a mouthpiece, I think, for a boxer. It's got some barnacles, some sargassum, this is 45 minutes of scooping through another windrow in the middle of the Sargasso Sea. Yeah. Cool. It's gonna flop out. Yeah. So we just pulled out this plastic bucket. 
and we found a trigger fish inside that's so big that it looks like it can't get out. I think his entire life is is in this jar. Really? There we go. Oh my god. He's still alive. Here's a trigger fish. Look at these teeth. Now look at this plastic bottle. Now we find these all around the North Atlantic gyre. Bits of plastic chewed on by marine life. 10, 10 degrees to port, Clive about 100 meters. Da -da -da. You know how gross that is? <laughs> Isn't that gross? That's my wife, that's why I married her. She's cool like that. So that expedition was the first of 20. We've now covered the globe. These, these red, these hot spots you see here, that's where the currents tell us. I work with other scientists, and some ocean modelers say, okay, here's where the currents would bring floating stuff. And that's where the red blotches are. It shows where the accumulation zones are. Those, those five big red blotches, those are the subtropical gyres. There are five gyres in the world's oceans where trash will accumulate. What we're finding is that it just fragments into smaller particles. They all look like this. Every sample I've collected, over a thousand samples around the world in 20 expeditions, they look like this. Small, like a, you get a handful of confetti in your net every time you, you skim the ocean surface. And we've done this now everywhere. We've gone to the North Pacific, North Atlantic, South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Ocean. And now every dot you see here is where we have been to drag our nets to find the microplastics. So we took our data, and with my oceanographer colleagues, we use the data to then populate the model, give it some numbers, and then extrapolate what the whole world might, might be holding in terms of the weight and count of plastics. Because that one question, no one knew. How much is out there, and where is it? And we published a paper, the first estimate of all plastics in all oceans, of all sizes, a quarter million tons from over five trillion individual particles. Now see, at this time, there was this public misconception about islands of trash in the oceans, and this busted that myth. We took all those 5.25 trillion particles, put them on a map, and that's how it looks. There is no island, it is, it's like a smog of small particles. Like the way smog is in the sky over big cities, it's smog in our oceans over the gyres and over our populated coastlines near India and the Mediterranean and China. So we're trying to change the narrative, give people a sense of reality. How we solve this is by solving things on land. And as we cross the ocean, we begin to realize what the, what the consequences are of all this trash. When we sailed from Japan back to Hawaii, a year after the Japan tsunami in 2011, 2012 we sailed, we were finding lots of debris from the tsunami with tons of marine life living on it using that trash to cross the ocean from one continent to another. And that's very new in the history of life on Earth, for things to go from one continent to another. Because logs don't make it, coconuts can't make it, but plastic can. And it's wreaking havoc on ecosystems on coastal margins around the world. But not just the transportation issue, also the plastic itself entangles marine organisms, seabirds and turtles and whales, marine mammals, and lots of fishes entangled by plastic waste. This also turtle got caught in a milk jug ring, and here's what happened. So she's since been named May West. Because mm -hmm. of thin waist. But the backbone, unfortunately, the backbone has never grown normally, and the turtle even flexes. So Plastics were designed to, to last forever. And it makes no sense we design products from it that are designed to be thrown away. So though that plastic ring, that small turtle walked into that and there was a hatchling, and when it grew, it could not break that plastic belt. It's been cut off since, but it shows the durability of plastics. Now, one thing that, that, uh, that was a profound experience for me, I went back to Kuwait two years ago, my first time in 25 years since the Gulf War. I went there to survey plastics in the Gulf of Arabia, a whole different mission than when I was there a quarter century ago. And I went to Kuwait, Dubai, Oman, and Qatar, 
But in Dubai, I met a veterinarian, a man that studies camels. He said, you want to see plastics? Come with me. We went deep in the desert over beautiful rolling sand dunes. Get to the top of one, and we're looking about, and we see this skeleton, these piles of white bones, each one being a camel skeleton. We walk down to one. He pulls one rib out of the sand, hands it to me, pulls out another, and he says, start digging. So we're there digging. It's a surreal experience for me, having been there 25 years ago. We're digging now in this camel skeleton. We get to the center of the chest, and here's what I found. It's a big wad of plastic bags in that camel's stomach. And the veterinarian said that, you know, it kills these camels in three ways. It creates blockages in their gut. The plastic bags themselves hold bacteria, it becomes a very septic environment. And it makes them feel full when they're not. And they dehydrate um, and become malnourished. So I realized again that I had this chance. I can either step back or step up. And the work that we do now is looking upstream, looking at plastics on land or up in our rivers and lakes. So we can identify which country, which company it comes from. And that worked for us in the Great Lakes. Five years ago, we surveyed the Great Lakes with a few colleagues from SUNY Fredonia and other universities. We're on this amazing boat, and we're finding enormous numbers of microplastics. But see, when you're in a lake or a river, the plastic has not degraded too much yet. So you know what it is. You can get an idea what it is, what the brand is, and you know where you are in the Great Lakes. We're in the United States and Canada. You can go to, go to the governments. And we did that. First thing we did, we published a paper. Once again, kick in your science, find your colleagues, get that documented. We did that. And that launched a big campaign. We were working with with other governments across the state, I mean across the United States, other state governments. We were working with artists and educators, filmmakers, politicians, CEOs of companies, all together saying, okay, these micro beads, these small little beads, they're a bad design. Where they come from are facial scrubs and toothpastes. They go on your face, you wash them down the sink, and they head out to our, our waterways. And all these people together said, okay, we've got to stop this. These products don't work these bad designs. I met two politicians, two senators. They drafted a bill. It went to President Obama's desk. And in 2015, he signed the Microbeat Free Waters Act, less than three years after that scientific paper was published. It was our great success story. And this can work for straws. This can work for straws, another bad design plastic bags, foam polystyrene cups. The single-use throwaway plastic culture has got to end because it doesn't fit a circular economy. Materials like paper, paper straws, paper bags, they fit a biological cycle, apple cores, banana peels, natural packaging. They can be part of a natural cycle. The technical cycle is where we've got to get good at recycling, reuse remanufacture things, capturing materials, keeping things in the loop. What we don't want is that linear economy, the current one we live in now, where things get thrown away, that magical away, which could be out to sea or a landfill or incinerator. That doesn't work in the world today. We want to shift that. We want to get away from the disposable plastics and move on to reusables and renewables. And I meet young people like you, leaders that are stepping forward, that are stepping up, not stepping back, stepping up to see change happen and making it happen. I met this young man. He was on Shark Tank. He had an idea. He said, you know what? I see a problem. And that is, there's a plastic bottle for my shampoo. There's a plastic bottle for laundry detergent. There's a plastic bottle for dishwashing liquid. And it's all just soap. And it's all so heavily packaged. He invented a little soap marble. You can take this, make a lather, you can wash your hair, you can wash your dishes, wash your laundry. And he's now doing very well with his company. He's only 15 years old. And he stepped up to the plate and made change happen. I met this young woman, she's a zero waste girl. She decided she's going to zero waste her life. 
All the plastic she consumed in three years fits in that jar. And it's things she couldn't help, like the plastic wristband when she went to the emergency room. And now she has her own company, the Simply Company, becoming zero waste. I met this woman when she was in 13, 14 years old in the Bahamas, and she said, I'm going to make Bahamas, the entire country, plastic free. Just two months ago, the Bahamas, the entire country banned plastic bags. And she was instrumental in making that happen. She and all of her, and her army of students. These young men saw that there are fishing nets abandoned washing up on distant islands. They took those and they make skateboards and surf fins and chairs and sunglasses. My best story of these young people, this, this classroom of students, 12 years old, one classroom said, when we go to the cafeteria, we eat on plastic trays. We use plastic forks and plastic straws and just creates all this trash and doesn't work for us anymore. They took all their plastic trays, they punched a hole in the bottom, and they strung them together, and they hung that, that snake of foam trays in the tree. The principal said, go ahead. They also saved that school $12,000 by using reusable baskets for their food. Well, two years later, the superintendent of all Los Angeles Unified School District, 900 schools said, I hear you. It makes sense, economic sense. We're off styrofoam, the whole district. 900 schools. And then two years ago, Los Angeles and Chicago, New York, Miami, Dallas, and Fort, uh, Fort Lauderdale together said, let's find one company that can make a, a compostable tray to replace styrofoam. And they all changed together. And it began with a classroom of 12-year-old students. They, they ignited the spark of change that went across, across the United States. You know, I feel so confident. I'm so optimistic because I meet young people that aren't going to stand for a polluted future. And they're making it happen. They're inventing the world that they want, like these students here. When I heard about the plastic problem, I never really noticed. But then when you actually start to see it, there's a lot of trash. Like, there's literally the like, trash right there. So. When I was a child, you'd walk on the beach and pick up shells. Now you pick up pieces of plastic. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And this is where it starts to come back to you and I, because we're now seeing no shadow of doubt that plastic is getting into the food chain. As plastic is out there floating in the ocean, it never biodegrades, which means it never fully goes away. Animals are eating these plastics because they think they're food. We go out and we fish for these fishes. When we eat them, these same toxins that the animals were eating gets in our bodies. It's not an issue we can ignore anymore, because it's right in our face. We're here at the Five Gyres Sea Change Youth Summit. Sea Change stands not only for sea change, but also for science, education, and action, which is what we've been up to for the last three days. We have an amazing crew of people, people like Jack Johnson. We have Jordan Howard here. We have Celine Cousteau. We have David Stover here from Boreo Skateboards. He uses old nets, like he recycles it, and makes it into skateboards. I really thought that was cool. We actually made some toothpaste, some environmentally friendly toothpaste. My favorite activity was the storytelling exercise. The kids started telling their stories, and then they started building on each other's stories. That's where we see activism spread like a, like a grass bushfire, you know? That's, that's what we want to happen out of something like this. I get inspired because I meet young people, like here at this youth summit, that say, I know it's a problem. This is what I'm doing. This is the one change I'm making. And the ideas are pouring out of these young minds. Well, it's World Environment Day. We've collected a bunch of plastic pollution. You got some? And now we're taking a look at it, kind of seeing what we find. This is the turtle bite. Yep. And this is like the trigger fish bite. Yep. This is representative of one of the quadrants that we uh, sift through the surface sand. So this is one square meter of beach. Gotta get home this garden to tend on the seed from the fruit berry to begin their own family trees. Teach them thank you and please. Spread their own roots, then watch the young fruit grow again. Uh, 
So yesterday, we collected a bunch of plastic pollution on the beach, and today, we decided to make a community art piece out of it. So I try to understand what I can hold in my hand and whatever I find. So one person can tell another, that person tells two. Two turns to four, four turns to hopefully four million. Who knows, you know, I'm optimistic. So we have to see the what? Change. See? Change. I see change every day. I see change in the way the world sees the future. I see change when we take responsibility as individuals. But I also see change in the youth. In the Bahamian youth. I see change when a youth finds their voice and knows that they can be a leader in their community. Things that our generation would have never dreamed of. I see change in all of us. We all can make a difference. I have seen the, the worst of plastic around the world, but I have seen the best in young people taking a stand, stepping up to the change they want in the world. And I'm confident that, that together we can all create a zero waste future. Thank you very much. To think about camels in the desert eating that many plastic bags. What more convincing do you need? Do we need to bring it home? How many times have you been out riding your bike or, or walking, you see those plastic bags snagged in a tree or blowing across the field? I actually have a friend who had one blow into the spokes of his tire and he flipped over. This could be a deadly accident. Plastic bags not just impacting the ocean, which is terrible, or camels, which is horrible, but in our own community, these single-use plastics are devastating to the local environment, harming us, as well as the creatures we share the world with. Let's rethink our use of plastic. It's a very easy way to be a clean water champion.